I'm Adam. And I'm Easter. And this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. Hey Easter, are you familiar with Harriet Tubman? You mean the woman from the Underground Railroad? Yeah, what do you know about her? She ran the Underground Railroad. Rabbits are known for building complex tunnel systems underground. Warrens. So in a way, rabbits have an Underground Railroad also. The Underground Railroad was neither underground nor a railroad. So the Easter Bunny is used to navigating complex burrows. Actually, cottontail rabbits live in nests rather than warrens. Except you, who lived with my grandma. True. In today's book, we get to see Harriet Tubman not as the Easter Bunny nor a conductor, but rather a little girl. Let's get started. Minty, a story of young Harriet Tubman by Alan Schrader, pictures by Jerry Pinkney. While Minty is a fictional account of Harriet Tubman's childhood, and some scenes have been invented for narrative purposes, the basic facts are true. Harriet Tubman, whose cradle name was Araminta, hence the nickname Minty, was indeed a slave on the Bordas Plantation in Maryland's eastern shore in the 1820s. She was known as a difficult slave and was often punished for it. As in this story, Minty was sent to work in the fields after proving herself too clumsy and not docile enough to be a house slave. Further, she was assigned, on one occasion, to tend to muskrat traps it's easy to imagine that it was in her nature to free a captured animal, just as she would ha one day help to free hundreds of slaves. A.S. The challenge that Minty initially posed for me came from not having a clear picture of Harriet Tubman's early childhood. However, I was able to imagine the spirited eight-year-old Minty using Alan Schrader's strong text in Harriet Tubman's biography, The Moses of Her People, as springboards. The National Park Service was also helpful. I had just finished an assignment for them for the Booker T. Washington National Monument in Virginia, as was the Banneker Douglas Museum in Maryland, where extensive research uncovered the style of plantations around Maryland during Minty's childhood and authentic details regarding background, dress, food, and living conditions of the enslaved, as well as the slave owners. My interest was to give some sense of Minty's noble spirit and open a window to understanding the day-to-day, sun-up-to-sundown life of a slave. By individualizing the hardships and overwhelming circumstances. In 1978, I was privileged to create the first Harriet Tubman commemorative stamp for the U.S. Postal Service. This book, then, brings me full circle with Harriet's life and courage. J.P. Minty, I know you hear me. Get in here, gal. Crouching in front of the big barn door, Minty listened. Mrs. Broda sounded angrier than usual. Get in here, I said. Don't make me come and get you. Minty giggled and then stuck out her tongue just as far as it could go. I'll come when I'm good and ready, she thought. But she didn't dare say it, not out loud. That would mean a whipping for sure. Pushing back the barn door, Minty crept inside. The barn was her favorite hiding place. The dray horses watched restless as Minty thrust her arms into a large pile of fresh hay. She dug deep down all the way to the bottom and pulled out her rag doll. Esther Lavina Louise was a sorry sight, with one foot missing and a pair of cracked buttons for eyes, but Minty loved her just the same. Now listen, she said, then in a low voice, Minty started to tell an old Bible story, the way her mother had told it to her. And then the shepherd boy, David, he picked up his tiny little rock, took aim, and sent it flying. Hit the old master smack in the head, killed him right there in front of everyone. Then they had a big old party afterward, and David got to move into this big house with a long table, and he was never hungry or nothing again. When the story was finished, Minty hid Esther back at the bottom of the haystack. It was getting dark and she had to light the fire, trim the wicks, and set the table up at the big house. That evening at supper, Mrs. Brodus was still angry. 
Why didn't you come earlier when I called? I had a mess of peas that needed shelling. Minty looked down at her feet. I didn't hear any call. Don't lie to me, girl, lest you want a whipping. Next time you better jump when I call. Mrs. Brodus took out her cloth napkin. I'm hungry, serve the potatoes. As Minty reached for the bowl, she accidentally knocked over a pitcher of cider. Mrs. Brodus jumped to her feet. Now look what you've done. Angrily, she turned to her husband. Do you see, Edward? In spite, pure and simple. Well, I won't stand for it. I don't want her in the house anymore. From now on, she's a field slave. That'll fix her. Then crossing the room, Mrs. Brodus opened one of the high cupboards and took something out. Minty's eyes widened. It was her rag doll, Esther. You didn't think I knew, did you? Said Mrs. Brodus. Here, she told her husband. Take this and throw it in the fire. No, Mrs. Minty screamed. She lunged forward, but Mrs. Brodus was faster. With a flick of her wrist, she hurled the doll into the open fireplace. Minty kicked and screamed, but Mrs. Brodus held her back until the doll was nothing but a pile of white ashes. That'll learn you, she said. Now get out of here, and don't forget, you're a field slave now. Minty ran out, choking back her tears. Wow, that is intense. Taking a kid's toy and throwing it in the fire in front of them? I don't care how much of a handful a kid can be. That's crossing a line. Clearly, they don't respect each other. Nope. Minty ignores the woman to do what she wants. Mrs. Brodus being a slave owner? That's true. It's harder to think of a more disrespectful act than slavery. How do you think this is affecting the young girl's mindset? The whole thing is a superhero origin story. I never thought of Harriet Tubman as a superhero, but I guess that she qualifies with all the people that she saved. Later that night, while her brothers and sisters slept, Minty told her mother and father what had happened. Well, said old Ben, at least they're keeping you on. What if they'd sold you south? I've seen them do it for less than spilling a pitcher of cider. Old Rit put aside her sewing. Come here, girl, she said. There's something I gotta say to you. Minty laid her head down on Old Rit's lap. It was soft and warm, and she liked feeling her mother's hand as it ran gently across her forehead. Listen to me, Minty. Now that you're in the fields, you gotta do a good job. Cause there ain't no other place for them to send you but downriver, and you don't want that. Once they sell you south, you'll never come back. I'm gonna run away, Minty mumbled. I am. Old Rit shook her head. Oh no, you're not. That's what you always say, and it ain't never gonna happen. You know what my daddy done told me? If your head is on the lion's mouth, it's best to pat him a little. Your head's in his mouth, Minty, but you sure ain't doing any patting. You're just fixing to get your head bit off. Old Rit bent down to whisper. Pat the lion, Minty. It ain't gonna kill you. The next morning at dawn, Minty was sent to work in the fields. For the next few months, her job was to plant wheat and rye and tend to the young corn. It was hard and heavy work, but Minty liked being outside. The breeze felt good on her forehead, and sometimes, when no one was looking, she'd push her toes deep down into the dirt and pretend she was a sunflower rising up, 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 all the way up till she could see clear across the Chesapeake Bay, till she could touch the clear blue sky. Then July came, and with it the heat and the mosquitoes. Some days Minty could hardly see what she was doing. She had so much sweat dripping down in her eyes. You ought to wear a bandana, said the woman next to her. Say, you're a little un. How old are you anyway? I'm eight, said Minty. The woman smiled, holding out her hand. My name's Amanda. My name's Minty. That's a pretty name, Amanda said. Real pretty. Be quiet, said the overseer, knocking the butt of his whip against his glossy black boot. Amanda lowered her voice to a whisper. Tell your mama to make you a bandana, or girl, you gonna fry your brains out. Whenever she was working in the fields, Minty kept looking for a way to escape. The dirt road behind the barn led to the Chop Tank River, but Minty had no idea where the river went. And what if there were snakes in the water? Minty was scared of snakes. I know what you're thinking, Amanda whispered. I can see it in your eyes. You're fixing to run away, but they'll catch you. 
And when they do, she pointed to a deep scar on her forehead. Believe me, honey, I've tried it, and it ain't worth it, uh-uh. Later that day, the overseer, Sanders, rode up on his horse and pointed at Minty. You, he said, come with me. Running behind, Minty followed him down the trail to the big Buckwater River. There, next to the bank, she saw a thick rope stretched across the surface of the water. Get in, Sanders ordered. But I can't swim, Minty said. And mister, it's cold. Don't sass me, girl. I said get in there and take hold of that rope. He watched as Minty waded into the water. You see those traps, the steel ones? Those are muskrat traps. Mr. Brodus wants you to check every one. And if there's a muskrat caught, you stuff them in here. The overseer thrust a heavy sack at Minty, then spat into the water. Don't you get any ideas now, he warned. Remember, I got eyes in the back of my head. Then spurring his horse, Sanders galloped off. Slowly, Minty started downstream, holding tight to the rope. The first two traps were empty, but inside the third was a fat, glossy muskrat who struggled to get free. Squatting down, Minty pulled apart the steel jaws of the trap. She glanced back to make sure Sanders was out of sight. Then happily, she let the muskrat go, releasing it downstream. It swam away vigorously, propelling itself through the water with its long, flat tail. Minty's eyes were wide with excitement. Go, she cried, splashing at the water. Go, swim away. She hurried to the next trap and did the same thing, releasing a second muskrat into the cold, muddy river. She was prying open a third trap when she heard a soft noise behind her. Sanders was sitting on his horse, not ten feet away. For a long moment, he and Minty stared at each other. Then suddenly, Minty dropped the trap and started to run. Sanders caught up with her at once. Jumping down, he bound her wrists together with a short piece of twine. That was a stupid thing to do, he said. You'll be sorry, gal. He took her back to the big house where Mrs. Brodus was on the porch cracking walnuts. She listened to what Sanders had to say. Minty never got a chance to speak for herself. Whip her, Mrs. B Brodus answered. Whip her good, and if it happens one more time, you tell my husband here, we'll sell her south. They'll know what to do with her in Georgia. The overseer tied Minty to the fence. Then roughly, he ripped open the back of her shirt. Old Rit was watching from a distance. As soon as she saw Sanders raise the whip, she dropped to the ground, her hands over her ears. Oh Lord, let it be quick, she moaned. Let it be quick, please, please, dear God, let it be over. Later, by candlelight, Old Rit did what she could to help Minty get through the night. Now this'll hurt some, she said, smearing green salve on Minty's back. Oh baby, don't cry, don't do it. Here, bite down on this, it'll help. She forced a hickory stick between Minty's teeth. I told you not to aggravate them, I told you. Why didn't you listen, Minty? Don't you got any sense? It was several days before Minty could walk again. Then early one morning, she was sent back to the fields where the rye and wheat stood tall. But Amanda was no longer there. Minty learned that she'd been sold south. And you're next, Sanders told her. I got my eye on you. It's hard to think that people actually endured such hardships. Not only that, but it also seemed like girls such as Minty maintained their adventurous and defiant outlooks in the face of these cruel actions. Because she was whipped and treated like an animal, she can sympathize with animals like the muskrats being held in a trap. Naturally, she wants to help them. They call that foreshadowing. Precisely because we already know that one day she'll grow up and help people escape slavery while simultaneously putting herself in harm's way. That evening, Minty told her father she was going to run away. I mean it this time, she said. Oh, I believe you. Only problem is you don't know where you're running to. Old Ben rose from his chair. Come outside, Minty. There's something I want to show you. Silently, they walked toward the barn. Old Ben lit his pipe and then pointed up at the sky. Do you see that star? He asked, the bright one? That's the North Star, Minty. And do you see all those stars next to it? With his finger, he traced the outline of the Big Dipper. That's the drinking gourd, he said. Now you listen to me. If you're gonna run, first of all, you make sure it's night. The darker, the better. And before you do anything else, you look up and find the North Star. It'll be the only marker you'll have, so don't lose it. Old Ben reached for Minty's hand. You follow that star, he said. 
It'll take you north, all the way to Philadelphia. Minty looked up at the dome of the sky. To her, all the tiny stars looked alike. Show me again, she said. Old Ben pulled her close and with the stem of his pipe began painting a picture of freedom in the clear night sky. The next morning, Old Ben told Rit that every Sunday he was going to take Minty into the woods. If she's planning to run away, there's some things she ought to know first. Rit didn't like the idea one bit. She was scared, but Old Ben told her to stay out of it. I know what I'm doing, he said. One of the first things he taught Minty was how to read a tree. If you're ever lost, he said, and you don't know which way is north, just look at the moss growing on the tree. It always grows on the north side. Can you remember that? Minty nodded. Then she stretched out her fingers to touch the yellow-green moss. It felt fuzzy and a little brittle. She scraped some off the bark. Don't eat it, Ben warned. It'll make you sick as a dog. That summer, deep in the forest, Minty learned how to catch and skin a squirrel. She learned to do bird calls, and before long she could run barefoot through the woods without making a sound. She learned how to catch fish with nothing more than a piece of string and a bent nail. And in the still, muddy waters of the creek, old Ben taught her how to swim. That's right, he said. Keep your head down. Don't move your arm so much. You're doing fine. The only thing Minty couldn't learn was how to start a fire. Old Ben watched as she struck at the flint, trying to get a spark. Just keep at it, he told her. You'll get the hang of it. On the last day of summer, old Ben and Minty took a tin bucket into the forest and filled it to the top with blackberries. Then they climbed a hill overlooking the river and watched the sunset. By the time they got back to the cabin, it was already dark. Old Rit put her hand into the bucket and laughed. I know just what to do with these, she said, pouring a plunk berries into a big wooden bowl. Minty, you go up to the big house and ask Mrs. for some sugar and two cups of flour. Tell her I want to make a pie, if she'll let me. Go on now, and you hurry back. Her bare legs shivering, Minty started up the dirt path. The night air was cool, autumn was coming on. She had nearly reached the big house when she saw a buckskin mare tied to an oak tree out front. Minty figured it belonged to a guest, someone visiting the Broadduses. The horse stood very still, watching her with uneasy eyes. Minty was about to turn away when a thought suddenly occurred to her. Reaching up, she placed her hand on the saddle. It was still warm, and not too high. This is it, she said to herself. This is my chance to run away. Remembering what old Ben had told her, she looked up at the sky. There it was, the North Star shining bright. By now, Minty's heart was beating rapidly. She wanted to run back to tell old Ben and old Rick goodbye, but she knew there was no time. It was now or never. Holding her breath, Minty reached for the rope. She tried to untie the knot, but her hands were shaking badly. The horse let out a nervous whinny. Shh, Minty whispered. Don't be afraid. But it was her own fear that was growing. Then, just as the knot started to come undone, the door of the big house opened. Minty heard her master's voice. Come outside, Nathaniel. We'll have a smoke. At that moment, Minty lost her courage. She couldn't do it. Not now. Not tonight. With tears in her eyes, she ran back down the hill to the cabin. At the door, old Rick caught her by the shoulder. Where's the flower? What did Mrs. say? But Minty pulled away and wouldn't answer. Leave her be, said Ben. Just leave her be, Rit. I'll fetch the flower. That night, after everyone else was asleep, Minty sat next to the fire, thinking. Why? Why hadn't she jumped on the buckskin? She could be long gone by now, halfway to Philadelphia. She might never get the chance again. Minty began to cry. She cried for a long time until the fire had nearly burnt itself out. It was getting cold in the cabin, and to keep warm, she buried her toes in the ashes at the edge of the pit. Up at the big house, a dog started to bark. Old Rit stirred in her sleep. Minty sniffled, then she wiped her nose with the back of her hand. But someday, someday she would run away. She would jump on the buckskin's back and ride, ride, ride the north wind, whipping through her hair, and nothing would stop her. Nothing. Minty could feel her eyes beginning to close. Then little by little, she fell asleep. Curled up between her brothers and sisters, she dreamed of sunflowers and stars, and the call of the whippoorwill, and a road through the forest that one day, when she had the courage, would carry her to freedom. Minty's father sure knows a lot about the forest. Why do you think he never tried to escape? He had nine children. Unless he figured out a way to take his whole family with him, her father would be abandoning ten people. 
How is it different for a kid? She wasn't in charge of taking care of anybody. Why do you think they talked about the time that she didn't take the horse? I think that it shows a time of regret. She had an opportunity to take action, but she didn't do it. So it was one of those moments that she probably looked back on and thought, I'll never do that again. Sometimes the actions that you don't take mold you just as much as the ones that you do. Well said. And speaking of taking action, if you've enjoyed this video, please take action and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm Adam. And I'm Easter. And this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. Authors note. It took many years, but Minty's dream came true. In 1844, when she was about 24, she married a free black man named John Tubman. Five years later, in 1849, Harriet Tubman made a daring and successful escape from the Brodus Plantation in Maryland. There was one of two things I had a right to, she said, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted. Traveling by night, Harriet Tubman made her way to Philadelphia, where she found a job in a kitchen of a hotel. But more than anything, she wanted to free others, just as she had freed herself. In 1850, she made the first of a series of perilous journeys back to the eastern shore of Maryland. There, at great personal risk, she helped hundreds of slaves, including members of her own family, escape north. Along the way, wherever possible, these fugitives were hidden in safe houses or barns owned by abolitionists, people who were opposed to slavery. This route of escape, which Harriet came to know well, was called the Underground Railroad. It was not underground, nor were there any trains or tracks, but the railroad carried former slaves north to such cities as Philadelphia and New York and from there across the border to Canada. I never ran my train off the track, Harriet said proudly, and I never lost a passenger. For her daring and tireless work as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, Tubman is remembered as one of the bravest and most admired women in American history. Did you know safe houses were dubbed stations or depots? Those who invited freedom seekers into their homes were called station masters and those who helped guide them on their path were called conductors. Terms like cargo referred to the enslaved people, while stockholders referenced those who helped financially. 